probably. He will uh, introduce himself and continue with the tutorials. Okay. Hi, thank you. Um, see, so yeah, I'm Jim Pavarsky. Uh, I, um, uh, I'm the author of Uproot and Awkward Array, and I'll be talking about both of these. Um, so uh, this is a tutorial uh, uh, that uh, you can follow along and um, uh, uh, take digressions to, uh, and so then you can uh, stop me and ask me about things as we go along if there's anything that you're interested in. Uh, in order to get that uh, interactive tutorial, uh, start at the, um, the Indico page you see here, and you see where it says that the materials for the tutorial will be located here. Uh, click on that link. It's at this uh, GitHub repository, and um, I'm going to recommend that everybody just uh, launch Binder. It's possible to run these things on your laptop, um, but um, rather than dealing with uh, uh, particular uh, issues, especially since we're remote, uh, let's just do it on Binder and then everything will just work. So click on the Launch Binder button, and this will take mm, a couple minutes. I'll wait for mine with you. Everybody's will probably take a slightly different length of time, but if it's taking a ridiculous length of time, click on the show to see the log. Should be saying that I found a built image. And that was nice and quick. I guess it was good that I uh, um, did it just before the meeting and woke up, reminded Binder that this is one that should have in cache. So what you'll get here is a uh, Jupyter Lab notebook, like that. Come up in a moment. This is all uh, running remotely. It's not running on your computer, so that satisfies all of the. Uh, uh, software installation, getting the data and such. Okay, and so you, you can run these things by um, uh, clicking on a box and shift enter. And you can also modify what's there if you want to do some exploration while I'm talking. Um, uh, and then uh, that might uh, prompt some questions. I'm gonna start actually on my machine. Uh, and I'll just go. The preliminaries is if you wanted to try to run it on your own machine, uh, which we're not doing right now. Table of contents. Um, I'll be talking about both Uproot and Awkward Array, and I intend to spend most of this hour talking about Awkward Array, um, but I'm going to do Uproot first because it's how you get the data, uh, and, uh, and so it makes a better introduction. Okay, so first of all, Uproot, um, what's it about in case you don't know? It is a pure Python reimplementation. Let's double click on things. Uh, it's a pure Python reimplementation of a uh, part of Root.io. I say significant because it's the part that is apparently mattered. Um, uh, so not all objects can be read, but uh, the ones that are most frequently needed are read. There's a chat question. Okay. Um, I'm just going to keep the chat up uh, so that if you want to ask a question, you can um, uh, uh, raise your hand by putting in a message in the chat and I'll see it. Okay. So the, uh, the idea is that uh, whereas PyRoot runs on top of root, and then you can have analysis scripts, or uh, root numpy is runs on root but not PyRoot, this is a stack of dependencies. Uh, Uproot is in a completely separate stack. Uh, it uses this awkward array that I'll be talking about later, which is itself based on NumPy. Um, but uh, other than that, it's, it's independent. It's looking at the root files, not the root software. So you can read uh, T trees containing 
basic types like SDL vectors, strings, uh, and some more complex data that are their limits. Um, and especially if they have are written with a high split level. So if you're trying to produce data that works well with uproot, uh, be sure to turn on splitting. Um, uh, you can also read histograms and other uh, objects in generic containers. And I decided actually not to show that in this in this meeting today, but um, you can look that up. Um, mainly actually because this file only has two trees. All right, so let's start by opening up the file. The uh, the design is, the interface is quite different for, um, because it is a, a fresh start. So, um, so we tried to be Pythonic in how we do this. So uh, a root file could be thought of as a dictionary of key value pairs, like a, a Python dict. So we can ask for its keys and its values. Its keys are uh, string events and its values are like uh, a root directory inside of this file. Um, so a couple of questions of things that you know you see right away. This B before the name events, um, this is because all of the strings retrieved from root are unencoded and Python 3 uh, says that unencoded strings are, uh, are, are a weird special case. Uh, they're byte strings, not regular strings. Um, and so in order to adjust for this, now that we're in the Python 3 era, uh, in, the in the near future, Uproot will always interpret these as uh, UTF-8. So that's going to go away. Uh, it doesn't make a difference from what you have to type in. And then the second question you might have is what's that colon one after the name? Uh, this is a, a cycle number. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, you can safely ignore it. Um, it's how root does uh, version tracking of objects in a file. So, um, and this colon one, colon two is how root represents it as well. So uh, nested directories are like a dict of dicts. So if I extract this uh, events from the file, I can look at its keys because it is a key directory and it's got a tree in it, two versions of it, cycle one, cycle two. Uh, and then you can get uh, the tree from the subdirectory by just you know, square brackets events, square brackets tree. And there are shortcuts because we do these things all the time. You can use a slash to, to navigate through directories and you can use all keys to do things recursively. And in general, you know, putting a prefix all in uproot means do things recursively. So you can get at the tree pretty quickly. All right, so now that we're done exploring the file, let's explore the tree. Uh, so we'll put it in a variable, and this is a good thing to do. I have seen uh, some examples in, in the wild where uh, because you can just select a tree like that, uh, uh, people select it that, that way all the time. It helps a little bit to put it into a variable because that means you're not going to reread it every time uh, because uh, uproot avoids caching um, unless explicit. We'll talk about that later. So, uh, so we get a ver this tree into a variable and we can look at its keys. Its keys are the branches of the tree. Um, all the variables, p, p, x, p, y, p, z. And often the first thing that I do when I look at them is uh, uh, not just keys, but there's this function called show which originally was, was just for my own debugging, but a lot of people use it uh, as a way of just, it's like the uh, uproot version of LS or, uh, or T tree print, um, because it gives you all the branch names and I stuck in this header by just putting some print statements in the cell. It gives you all the, the branch names. If they're complex data, then you would see the streamers here. And then this is the interpretation of that data as Python. And this as D type means it's going to become a NumPy array with a particular NumPy D type. As jagged, we'll talk about that later. Uh, complex objects need streamers, but this file doesn't have any. So, so this is this is a good first thing to look at because uh, uh, maybe you can't read a branch because we haven't handled its type. You know, it's too complex to read. 
that's how this started as a debugging thing, <laughs> but now it's just uh, generally useful. And then there's a bunch of other uh, metadata that you, you might expect to find in a tea tree, like the, the number of entries or the number of uh, bytes or number of baskets uh, in each of these. You, you can drill down to the, to the small level. So I see a chat. How is making the gray boxes expand? I haven't used Jupyter before. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so when you, uh, each of these gray boxes, when you click on it, it's editable. This is a Jupyter thing, by the way. Uh, and then you can put in any kind of code there. It does do something dumb. No entries plus one. Uh, shift enter evaluates the cell. Actually, shift enter evaluates the cell and goes on to the next cell. So you can shift enter all the way through. And uh, control enter evaluates just the same one. All right, um, unless there's other questions, I'll, I'll move on to um, uh, getting NumPy data out of root branches. So uh, there are several methods for this. Um, very similar names, uh, very similar behavior and almost all the same parameters. Anything with this, any, param, any function arguments with the same name have the same meaning. Uh, so uh, if you see that there's a lot of different methods for getting arrays out, uh, don't panic. The, the different versions of them are just for uh, different conveniences. You can use any one of them, uh, but it just might be making life a little more or less convenient for you. So for instance, if you have selected a branch, if you're using this T3 as a, as a dict, and you get this event ID branch, you can just say dot array and you got a NumPy array. Um, it's sometimes inconvenient to, to drill down to the branch level. Maybe uh, you just write on the, on the tea tree. You can ask for dot array. And now you have to give it the, the branch name because you, you, have to add, you have to tell which one you're asking for. Um, it's often convenient to get multiple uh, arrays at once. Like, let's say that we want both the event ID and the event particle count. Uh, then you, you pluralize it. <clears throat> That's what I mean by there's a lot of different methods. Array is one method. Arrays, plural, is a different method. They do virtually the same thing. It's just that arrays give you more than one. Um, and sort of a, a, a pitfall here is that if you were to ask for just one of them, it works, but notice the output is different. The output is a container type. It's a dictionary, whereas the output of this, when it's, when it's singular, is not a dictionary. It's just the array. But that's how I mean it's convenient, because obviously, you know, clearly you could just take that and EVT ID just pull it out, and then it's the same thing. And so it really is convenience. Some people think that it, it might be related to performance. It's not. It's just calling the same thing. Uh, also, as a matter of convenience, uh, if you're selecting multiple arrays, you can use wildcard patterns. So just using a star or, you know, the curly brackets for, for normal file, uh, file name glob type patterns, you can do that to get everything that starts with EVT. Um, file name globs, like if you're doing LS on a, uh, in a terminal, uh, that's the syntax that this is using. Uh, you can also do regular expressions, which are more general, but, you know, more robust. Uh, you do the verbal, uh, ver eh, you do the regular expressions by surrounding it with slashes, and maybe uh, uh, ignore case in this case. All right. So you could have done all of that with just the, the plain branch dot array function. It's just that these are think, making things more convenient, so you don't have to write your own for loops. Um, another convenience, uh, uh, something that will soon be unnecessary because uh, name decode equals unicode will become the default, is um, if you specify an encoding, uh, then these things come out as 
real Python 3 strings and not byte strings. And the byte strings are a little bit annoying as you saw up here. Since this dictionary was a byte string, I had to get the key out using a byte string key. If I used a regular string, Python 3 would complain that, you know, the string EVT ID is different from the byte string EVT ID, which Python 2 did not complain about. So, um, so yeah, this will become a, uh, a default, but for now, um, if you say name decode equals UTF-8, um, you can make all of these keys uh, real strings. Um, convenience number two, instead of getting this dictionary out that has all of the branch names as keys, uh, if you are selecting a very particular set, you know exactly which ones you want, and maybe you want a tuple. So you can say the output type is tuple. And actually, you can put a lot of different containers there, like list or uh, even pandas data frame. Um, and it'll give you all of the arrays in that kind of container. Uh, the tuple is a particularly useful one because you can use uh, Python's tuple assignment. So we say EVT ID comma uh, particle count equals this thing with the tuples. And then that has just assigned two variables. Whereas with a dictionary, you'd have to do a couple long, couple more lines of code. Oh, okay. Question, will the update to UTF-8 strings remove the need to use byte strings in selecting arrays from that container? Uh, yes. And in fact, it'll require you to not use byte strings. So that's going to be, that's going to happen when upper three gets updated to upper four. It'll be a major version change because that would break syntax. Um, uh, and that's why I haven't done it so far. It's, it'll be a breaking change for the better. So it's got to be a big version number change so that everybody's aware. Okay. If there are no other questions, oh, does it work with T-Chain? So um, I'll be showing something that uh, is a good replacement for T-Chain. Um, so T-Chains are not object, they probably could put a T-Chain in a root file, but usually the way that you use T-Chain is you use T-Chain to, to group together a bunch of root files. Uh, and I will be showing a different syntax for uh, iterating over a bunch of root files. And I'll be showing that after talking about iteration in general. So I'll get to that. All right, <clears throat> so memory management, um, so the array methods have, have been reading entire branches into memory, uh, and you might not have enough memory to do that. So the very simplest thing that you can do is set entry start and entry stop on the array command, and uh, it will read as little, it will read as few branches as it needs to in order to, sorry, it'll read as few baskets as it needs to in order to um, uh, get you just what you ask. So that saves, uh, saves memory. Now, uproot is not aggressive about caching. Uh, if you call this function many times from many small batches, as we might have with particular entry start and stops, then it will read from the file every time. Uh, it's explicit so that you can know what it's doing. Uh, you can avoid frequent rereading by assigning arrays to variables, as we assigned the t tree to a variable t Three. Uh, but then you'd have to manage all those variables and that's inconvenient. So uh, instead there's a there's a mechanism uh, on all of these uh, array methods to explicitly cache. So we can create a cache with an acceptable upper limit for the size of your RAM. Uh, you, you make this maybe half the size of your RAM. You can't go all the way up to the total limit. Um, and uh, the first, if you just pass this in as a parameter, the first time it's called, the object is not in cache and it reads it from the disk. And then a sec subsequent time that exactly the same code is called, it'll get the array from, from cache. So the advantage is that the same code can be used for both first time and subsequent times, and thus you can put this in a loop. 
Um, and then, you know, you don't have to check in your loop to see if this is the first time or whatever. And so naturally, uh, caching, fetching from a cache is much faster than reading from disk. Our file isn't very big, so I'm going to read everything as part of this test. And this time it runs it many times, uh, seven times in this case. So yeah, it, it wasn't, you know, it's not a very big file and it doesn't take very long to, to load. Uh, but, you know, 700 milliseconds versus four milliseconds. Uh, and that's because when it's getting it from the cache, it's not reading it from the disk. Uh, and the value of an explicit cache is you get to control it. So use the cache has got 52 objects in it. You can clear it and now it doesn't have anything in it. And you can control your memory usage that way. This cache, by the way, uh, anything that works like a dictionary is a, uh, will work as a cache. It doesn't have to be a special uh, uproot brand array cache. And in fact, this is just a wrapper around a, a library called Cache Tools, which um, uh, a lot of caching tools in Python have the interface of just a regular dictionary. So you can put a lot of different things into this. Okay. So um, uh, setting the entry start and entry stop can get annoying. And most likely we're going to want to do a loop. We're going to want to select uh, a handful of baskets. All, all of, sorry, eh, I keep using the wrong words. A handful of branches, all uh, of the branches involved in analysis at the same entry starts, and same entry stops each. And you could write a loop for that, but uh, 3.iterate does that loop. And the entry steps is just saying that uh, we'd like uh, a thousand entries in each time. And here, all I'm doing is printing out the, the length of the, uh, the arrays that I've read. Uh, and you can see that they're all the same length because they're all aligned, so you can use. So inside of this for loop, you can put an analysis. Uh, and keep in mind that this is a loop over batches, not events. So if you develop an analysis on a small file where everything fits into memory nicely, and you've written all of this uh, code that uh, that works on arrays, take exactly that code and put that code in, in the loop. Um, you can set the array uh, steps to a size in memory, like uh, in this case, 100 kilobytes. Uh, that's a ridiculously small, um, but you know we have a small file and I wanted to show more than one step. And then with the same size, if we are reading only one branch instead of many branches, then 100 kilobytes is the whole thing. So those are just conveniences, so you don't have to calculate it yourself. Now getting back to T-chain, all of this that I'm doing with 3.iterate, uh, that iterates over parts of a single tree in a single file. You can do with uproot iterate, which takes a collection of files with a common tree name, uh, and then everything else is the same. So this is how you would iterate over a bunch of files. Uh, and these files, because I have only one file to, to work with in this example, I'm just reading the same file over and over again. Uh, but more likely what you would do here is you would put um, my directory uh, star.root or something like that because it knows about glob patterns. Is there still a benefit to using a cache while using iterate? Uh, does it read ahead, for instance? Um, I think you would not want to use a cache while iterating because uh, you've probably written your analysis code to work on just the arrays that you have in one batch. Um, and that means that the previous iterations batch are no longer useful and you want them to go away. So, um, uh, uh, so in that case, you would want the, the cache to clear every time. So I think that you probably use 
you probably not use caching when you're doing that. I should say that <clears throat> there's two levels of caching. I showed you the high level array cache. There's also a basket cache, and you can delve into those parameters by just going into the uh, uh, documentation. Um, the iterate method uh, implicitly uses basket caching so that if your entry size is smaller than, uh, you know, if it's, if it's cutting not exactly at a basket boundary and you've read more than you needed to, it will keep that around for the next step. Um, but that's done transparently. You don't see that. That's, that's an example of where there's a little bit of implicit caching going on. Oh, that explains what I was thinking. Okay, good. Okay, good. Um, so now if there's no other general questions about Uproot, um, this section on jagged arrays in Uproot is a segue into the next section on, on awkward array. Um, you saw that the interpretation of these, when I did show, some of them were as D-type, and that just means these are plain NumPy arrays, uh, nothing special. And some of them were as jagged. <clears throat> uh, and this means that uh, the data can have multiple values per entry. So here's an example of a jagged array. <clears throat> The PDG ID of the, the particles, uh, you can see that there's some uh, different familiar looking uh, PDG IDs. Um, <clears throat> and each of the events has a different number of them, which we can see by uh, looping over this jagged array. So uh, we can take this PDG array, put it in a loop, and now each one of these groups event can be one of these things has a length and these lengths differ. So I'll print out the length and I will uh, print out the names of these particles. And I'm going to use this uh, library called particle. Along the way, whenever there's a, uh, a useful tool from scikit-help, I will just use it. Um, but there's, uh, we, have a, we have a bunch of these little tools that do useful things for particle physics. This one turns uh, PDG IDs into names and various other things. So here, uh, um, with this manual Python for loop, which are uh, in general kind of slow, but just for uh, Getting a sense of this data, we'll do a, a loop over the first 30 of them and look at all the particles. <clears throat> you can see the first one has 51, the second event has 26, the third event has 27. Uh, they really vary. Um, although you can iterate over jagged arrays with loops, the idiomatic and faster way to do it is with array at a time functions. So here, let me use the output type as tuple to get three jagged arrays. Uh, vertex x, y, and z. And then instead of uh, looping over them to calculate uh, the uh, displacement of the vertex, as this, the distance of the vertex, uh, I'm going to use array at a time functions from, from numpy square root and squaring these. So since each one of these is a jagged array, uh, each time you do this, it's calculating the squares of all of the entries of the entire array. We'll be seeing that in more detail later, but this is the more idiomatic and also faster way to do it. Uh, so now we can use them in plotting, and here are a few more links to uh, MPL help, which has uh, conveniences for uh, high energy physics plotting in Matplotlib. Uh, Boost histogram is making uh, high energy physics type histograms, um, which are surprisingly uncommon, histograms in which uh, you make a histogram object and fill it, which is a kind of unusual interface that we use in particle physics. Um, and yeah, so just plotting these, uh, these vertices. Uh, and an analysis before I get into the awkward array section proper, 
would do things like, oh, these distances uh, uh, give me a jagged array of booleans of which ones are uh, greater than 0.01. Right there. And then if I have a jagged array of booleans, I can apply that to my jagged array of particle IDs and select them. Uh, and so looping over this selected version, you can see that there are fewer. This one even has zero passing the cut. Um, you can do things like, oh, get a the antiprotons, it's particle ID. Okay, use that as a um, as a selector. Give me a jagged array of trues and falses of whether or not this is these are antiparticles. And then do things like show me the vertex distribution if is antiproton. And so you can get a different uh, and so you can do an analysis basically. So that's all I was planning to say about uproots. And that was a segue into awkward array. So any last questions about uproot uh, now that we're half an hour in? Uh, and I'd like to spend the rest of the time talking about awkward array. Any quick questions, put them in the chat. No, I'll go on. All right, so um, uh, awkward array is a library for manipulating arbitrary data structures in a NumPy-like way. So the idea is that you have a large number of identically typed nested objects in variable length lists. So um, uh, these jagged arrays were a first instance of having something which is not purely numeric data because the, uh, the lists of different lengths are not uh, are neither pure numbers nor are they uh, rectilinear tables of pure numbers. But we'll have some arbitrary data structures that have the same types from one instance to the next. But uh, you know some of them can be missing. Uh, missing values and others can have different lengths and such. Uh, and since you have uh, uh, on the order of gigabytes of memory uh, and on, you know, to order one, that's billions of elements. Um, so uproot four is going to, oh yeah, so uproot array, uh, there's a, a version zero which is in use uh, in some LHC analyses. And it, uh, actually we've been using it for about a year now. And it's revealed some design flaws. Uh, so we'd like to take this opportunity to uh, rewrite it. Um, that's actually something that just happened in the past year, started uh, last September and finished uh, in March. Um, uh, rewritten with both uh, better internals, but also uh, a better user interface, uh, which means a different user interface. So it's going to be a transition. Uh, at the moment, the original awkward array was called, was in a package called awkward, and the new one is in a package called awkward one. So you can use them independently and at the same time. Uh, Uproot has not yet been updated to use awkward one. Um, but that's what version four is going to do. Upward four is going to be using upward one. At the moment, for the sake of this tutorial, uh, I will ex explicitly import this upward one and convert the data from root zero into upward one. So I'm just going to show that you can you can translate these. It's actually like a zero copy transformation. It's um, uh, just changing some metadata, but it moves us into the new into the new library, and here now I've just read everything from the file, and converted them all into the new format. Uh, so there's a bunch of new style arrays, and this is what we'll be using for this tutorial. <clears throat> um, along the way, uh, uh, I'm including. These cells that you can evaluate to uh, learn more about these, uh, these are just the, the doc strings. Um, I must have said it somewhere in this tutorial, but it's also awkwardarray.readthedocs.io. Just that, that's enough. Um, and here's some documentation with a fake front page that needs to be replaced with a real front page, but 
all of the functions have, docu have documentation. And all of these are the same thing as the doc strings. So um, letting you know that that's available. OK. So as before, we can iterate over these things uh, as if they were Python lists. Uh, but you only want to do that for small scale exploration or doing stuff on the command line just to uh, get a sense of what your data look like. Uh, because um, it's usually simpler, it depends on what you're doing, simpler to uh, write array at a time operations, but it's also considerably faster. In this example, what am I doing? I'm computing the, the vertex distance. Uh, and when iterating over in Python, I asked it, please only do that once, and it took 12 seconds. And then please do that 100 times uh, in the uh, vectorized form, the array at a time form. And, uh, and the numbers to compare are 12 seconds versus 29 milliseconds. Really, um, you know, there's, there's factors of hundreds. So um, we're going to want to be using the array at a time operations, but that's a different way of thinking about these things if you're used to writing for loops in, in Python or C. Um, another thing that I'm going to do is, uh, remember I loaded up all of these arrays and now each one of these branches is a separate array. Uh, since we can do data structures, let's do data structures. Uh, this giant block, is specialized to this particular format of file where I'm taking each one of these arrays that came from one of the branches and I'm zipping them together into a data structure and you can read about zip. Uh, and so I'm making this uh, um, single variable called uh, events, which is the whole thing. So the type of events is that, which maybe could be formatted better. Uh, uh, I manually put in some formatting, you know, just copy this and, you know, uh, uh, indented it by hand um, and to show that, that these are objects, that uh, there's, there's 10,000 of them, they have an ID, there's a, uh, sub record within that called true and it has fields q2 x y w2 new uh, there is uh, particles which is a jagged array it's a variable number of things times particle objects which have uh, all of these fields and some of them I, I decided to give them names 0.3 and some of them I just left them as generic records so now um, uh, you can see what this data structure is done uh, by converting it into Python lists because those display nicely on in Jupyter. And here I'm just going to take the first event and the first particle. And what does that look like? It looks like this. It looks like, you know, um, an object. Uh, you could convert all of the data into these uh, into these lists, but that would be slow. Um, and here's uh, what is this? The last event, and I'm taking the first ten particles from the last event. So, last event. Oops. Last event. First ten tar particles. Oh yeah, and then also I'm particularly picking out the smear record origin vertex, and I'm looking at just those. Question, why is AXIP needed? Isn't this structure part of the root tree already? Um, the, uh, only implicitly. Actually, uh, what is stored in a root tree, it, you know, the, all of the nested C++ objects that make up uh, uh, a C++ data structure, when it's saved to a root file, the, uh, the structure of those C++ objects is only stored in a naming convention in the branches. Uh, and uproot does not work that naming convention backward, although I suppose one could. Um, so. <laughs> 
So I manually put put things together uh, with zip. Um, maybe there would be uh, a, a nice utility to look at the naming convention of those branches. Uh, and uh, I think also it's it's partly naming convention and partly uh, there's some data in the streamers uh, to generate the appropriate act.zips uh, and put it back together, uh, but that hasn't been done. Um, so uh, there was this bit of code that was pulling some very specific things out of this. Uh, alternatively, uh, here I used the, the bracket uh, uh, I used just a minus one in the bracket uh, to pick out the last event and uh, a, a slice in the bracket to pick out the 10 particles. Actually, pulling out particles is, uh, uh, is, a, is a string get item, as is the smear, the origin, the vertex. These are just different syntax for the, for the same thing. So you could do it all inside one where bracket, where you're picking out last event, particles, slice of the 10, smear origin vertex. It's, it's the same thing. I wanted to show that equivalence. Okay, so here um, I just put the stuff together. Uh, I had all these, these separate arrays and I put them, actually the, the splitting of the C++ objects into these separate branches read them as arrays, and then I unsplit them uh, with this act zip. Uh, that is really just uh, uh, arranging deck chairs. Uh, that is just changing uh, metadata. So the logical view for this, yeah. so what, what, what's happening here is that in awkward array, there is a physical layout, which is just arrays grouped in a tree structure and a logical view, which is particles as nested of lists of objects. This is what you're looking at. You're looking at the logical view. You are seeing this list of lists of muon objects. That's how you want to be looking at it and thinking about it. But that whole time, all of these, all of the data is actually arranged as arrays grouped in a tree structure. And when you do that zipping, the data themselves are not changed. They're left in these arrays. They're just presented to you differently. So zipping these uh, arrays together costs nothing. Uh, the time doesn't scale with the size of the data. Um, uh, this is different from actually unsplitting branches into uh, C++ objects because that's actually a copy, copying the data into C++ objects. So this is leaving everything in the columnar view, um, but leaving everything in the columnar format and just viewing them as uh, as objects. And that means for, and, and that's hidden from you as a data analyst, so, so you don't need to worry about that. But one of the things that it means is that zipping and its, alter, and its opposite projecting uh, are essentially free. These, these structures exist, but they're really fluid. You can put things together into records and you can separate them out uh, without worrying about how long it takes because it's not an operation that scales with the size of the data. So here we've we've had the objects all packed together into these particles and the px is an attribute in those particles, but then if you say events.particle.px, then you re remove the structure and now you're just looking at all the px's in nested lists. This is var, these are jagged. And you, see, you can see the two brackets. Um, this costs nothing. You should be, uh, um, feel free to zip things together and project them out uh, freely. And the reason that I'm calling it projecting is that um, when you pull px and py out of the particles, you don't have to be looking at one particular event, one particular particle in order to do that. Like the natural thing to say would be, all right, pick the 999th event, it's, take the particle field from it, take the 12th particle, dot pz and show me that. But it's the same thing to pull out the particles for all events and then, oh, I just want the 999th event and then the 12th particle, pz. 
or really all of these different orders are equivalent. Uh, the, uh, and that's why it's useful to look at these uh, slices with the uh, uh, attribute as one, one kind of get item in a, in a series of get items um, is because they, they commute. The uh, picking out a column commutes with picking out a row, even if those rows are jagged as it is in this case. All right, so um, the, the, the point of that was, is to show that uh, these records are really fluid. Uh, that's, that's my favorite word for this. It's a conceptual aid, not a constraint on how long things take to compute. Uh, moreover, uh, in C++ land, we have uh, methods on these C++ objects. Um, uh, if you have a vertex object with a X, Y, Z coordinates, you would like to have a, you know, dot distance to compute its, its absolute distance. Um, and we can do the same thing. Since we have named some of these, these records, we can attach behaviors to those names. And behaviors are functions uh, that we attach through a syntax like this. We say, there's this global behavior. Wherever you see uh, numpy.absolute applying to a point three object, no matter where it is in the depth of a structure, use this function instead of what you would ordinarily do, which is uh, pass the absolute value to all the fields. Or if you're subtracting two of them, uh, instead of doing the, the de default behavior uh, to when it's applying to 2.3 objects, use this uh, distance. So then we've, we install those behaviors. Now um, computing the absolute value of vertices uh, gives you one value per vertex. And you know what, in order to show what it would have done otherwise, I'm going to turn these off to get the default behaviors. And what it would have done by default is pass the absolute value down to each of the fields, which is not what you want. Um, similarly, for, for taking a difference of two vertices, the default behavior ooh, might not even work. Uh, can't subtract. This is a bit wiser. Oh, not, I'd have to think about what's going on there. But the over, the uh, apparently the the default behavior doesn't even make sense for subtracting 2.3 objects. But uh, the overriding behavior, uh, subtract vertex from itself or subtract two different vertices from each other, um, that does make sense. So this is not the sort of thing that you probably be doing in a data analysis. This is the sort of thing that a framework developer building something on top of awkward array might do. Uh, but then if you've got that, then you'll, you'll be able to do all these things. You'll be able to use these things as objects that have methods. Um, you know, the methods can even be uh, uh, attached so you can say things like .pt. Uh, so that's what we're doing here. Um, overriding the record class, overriding the array class, so that they'll have a PT property. And what does the PT property do? Well, it, you know, the sum of squares of X and Y and square root. And then here we are overriding all particle records to be this thing instead of a generic record. And all arrays, no matter how deep, uh, should be particle arrays. And then when we've overridden that, now if you pull out ev event zero, particle zero, it has type particle record instead of act record, instead of the generic, it'll be a particle record. And that means that you can call PT on it. So that's something that a framework developer building something on top of awkward array might do for you. Uh, and then this last one, because it's applying to arrays, computes the PT for everything all at once. <clears throat> so that, 
that's something that a, a framework developer might do on top of awkward arrays. So uh, uh, you'll probably be using it in the context of some particular experiment, and the experiment will have some particular um, methods that are useful for that experiment already defined. Okay. So if there's no qu questions, I'll keep on going. Oh, and I just noticed uh, we've there was supposed to be uh, an hour for this meeting. Uh, we are five minutes from that time, and I'll show you. I wish I could make a link to that, but where we are in the schedule is here. I'm about to talk about filtering. Uh, so doing cuts on events and particles, which is a you know basic bread and butter analysis thing to do. Uh, then after that is flattening, uh, which is something you need to do if you're going to be making plots or you want to get just plain old NumPy arrays because you're going to be feeding them to machine learning or something like that and they want NumPy. Um, broadcasting is kind of a side note and then I think you wanted to get to combinatorics. Uh, making combinations of particles. Um, so to do that, I uh, will either need to skip or I'll need to um, uh, go over time. And I don't know how okay you are with uh, either of these things. So, um, so please speak up. Um, do, do, do people have to leave at 10? Um, do people want to leave at 10? <laughs> uh, and if so, I can tell you one last thing and then, we, then we've got to go. Uh, oh. Jim, if you are fine with going beyond 10 um, a.m. Central, um, then, then please do so. I'm, I'm sure okay. some have to disappear in meetings, but we are providing a recording. So, um, so meaning anyone who has to leave will be then able to follow up um, on the last steps on the recording. So I think it's completely up to your schedule. If you have a little bit more time, please, please continue, so. Okay, great, okay. Yeah, I am happy to keep going. Um, and okay. so for those who do have to leave, um, in the recording, this is exactly one hour in. So you'll be able to find where we were and pick up from there. Yes, uh, Jim, I'm sorry that I'm interrupting you. That actually, uh, while we talked uh, to you that one hour is something is good, uh, there were no any one hour in our uh, announcement or something. So if you have time to go over time and you have time to explain everything, please just go ahead and uh, just in case for anyone who needs to go to the 11 a.m. is the meeting, they will be recording so you can uh, then go back and hear this recording. Great, okay. Yes, uh, then that's great then. Thinking that I had one hour um, made me prepare what is apparently <laughs> the right amount for one and a half or two hours. So, all right, great, then uh, let's keep going. So this is where we left off, filtering, cutting events. Uh, here we are. Okay, so the, uh, the methods for doing cuts, doing normal particle physics things, is following the way that NumPy does it. Uh, with the exception that these are not regular events, not regular structures. So uh, NumPy has a really uh, quite flexible way to slice up rectangles and hyper rectangles uh, with, uh, you've already seen some of these, uh, I've been calling them get items because that's, that's the low level function name, the um, things in square brackets slices and square brackets. We can pick out individual elements and you can pick out slices with a, using a colon and that's all documented elsewhere. Uh, but you can you know cut up a rectangle lots of different ways. Um, uh, but that's just rectangles. We have um, uh, structures that uh, that are jagged. Basically, if you were to draw this rectangle, it would have a jagged edge. Um, uh, but we can use the same kind of syntax. Uh, um, 
here uh, picking the first five events and picking the first article key from every one of those um it's it's the same thing that you would do in numpy so the fact that there that these are variables that these are variable length lists uh, doesn't affect it you can pick say the first two particles in all events so here we have all 10,000 come out um, but we've picked the first two particles and just like slices in numpy if uh, if some events has zero particles and that is true in this data set there's a small number of them uh, uh, the slice uh, picks at most the first two so whatever is not there then go through um, so pick out the the first direction of the last event so the Python negative indices work so minus one means the last one and this is a direction um, so those are all uh, what NumPy calls basic slices. Then it has, then NumPy calls, what NumPy calls advanced slicing is using an array as a slice. So here is um, this one particle count. This one is, uh, is a flat array. So this is equivalent to NumPy. Um, particle count greater than 100. For some of these, it's false. <clears throat> For some of them, it's true. Um, yeah, so here's one where it's greater than 50. And just to, sh oh yeah, yeah, just to show you that, yeah, there's 16 of these that have uh, greater than 100. Count non-zero, count the, the trues. Um, you can put this array inside square brackets and as we saw in the segue before, uh, this is going to select events everywhere that uh, that this array is true. So you can carry around these arrays. You can just have this array, and and it is your cut. Uh, and you can you know can perform logical ands and logical ors on them. Um, you know before applying them to your events. Uh, you can mix advanced indexing with uh, uh, with basic indexing. So here, uh, event particles inside the square brackets. On the first dimension, uh, we select events that have at least two particles, and on the second dimension, uh, we take slices of just those two particles. <coughs> And uh, uh, this is good because it can help you avoid errors. Uh, this would have been a better example, picking the zeroth thing. I want to eat, eat these events to have at least two particles, and I want to pick up just the zeroth particle, the first, I should say, the first particle uh, from each one of them. And that is something that if you didn't qualify, if you didn't say events that have at least one of them, and you just tried to take all of them, it would be an error because uh, the index is out of range for, for some of these. Ah, that's, that's where I'm showing it. Throwing it down here, okay. So I just got ahead of myself. Um, if you didn't have a branch, uh, if you didn't have a branch named uh, particles.count, you can count the particles yourself. Uh, there is a function, acnum. This, you really should have a, um, an app. There's an app for that mentality. Uh, um, for a lot of the basic things that we need to do, like find the number of particles in each event in order to apply a cut like that, there's a function for it. And it's called num. So. Uh, num events particles is the same as what happens to be in this branch. Uh, if we were working with a file that didn't have that branch, 
then that's this is how we would be doing it. Um, yeah, so then we can uh, combine advanced indexing with advanced indexing. So this is saying at least two particles. And then this one is saying after we've made that selection for all of the events, pick the first and last. And as a NumPy subtlety, why didn't I do it this way? Apply to the first dimension and then the second dimension. Uh, this is following NumPy rules, which are uh, if you put two arrays in the same slice, it tries to broadcast those arrays together, and these two arrays are not going to broadcast. Uh, they're not going to fit with having the same shape, uh, and so that's why doing this stuff over. Uh, that actually is a, an arcane rule that I wish NumPy didn't have, but because NumPy has that, awkward array must do the same thing. Uh, so if you ever encounter that situation, know that you can uh, uh, split your, uh, if you've got two advanced indices to, to run, you can split them into two separate get items. That's a solving that problem. <clears throat> so uh, there we can do all the same things that NumPy can do, except uh, we have uh, variable numbers of particles. But we can also go beyond NumPy, and we want to do this for some, some particle physics applications. Like, let's say that we have the absolute value of these vertices, which remember we've overloaded, so that uh, this return, well, I'll just read it. This returns a bunch of distances, uh, and they're the jagged array of distances, because there's a different number of particles in each event. Uh, and now we ask for which ones are greater than 0.1. That's false for some of them and true for others, but it's inside, it's applying to the particles, not applying to the events. So we can take this jagged Boolean array and put it in brackets for this jagged array. And if everything lines up, all of those booleans per particle line up with the particles, which they do by construction, uh, then we can select particles. So now we have a syntax for selecting events using the plain NumPy uh, boolean arrays, and a syntax for selecting particles, which is using jagged arrays of booleans. And um, maybe the just like just like broadcasting in general, the when you go into any discussions of broadcasting and you read about them, it sounds uh, more complicated to explain than to show in examples because because uh, it, it does the natural thing. It does what you would want. Uh, and then explaining what is the natural thing and what is what you would want is more complicated than just doing it. Um, uh, to kind of illustrate how these, you know, when, when you start putting these together, it, it does the natural thing. Consider uh, maximization function. It um, picks the maximum distance of each vertex. Well, the distance of each vertex is jagged. The maximum distance of each vertex is not because there's, there's one per event. There's one maximum vertex per event. And that means that if you include the max, now you're selecting events. So then the way to read this is you read this one by saying select particles where the vertex is greater than 0.1. And the way that you read this is you say select events where the maximum vertex is greater than 100. So these complex rules put together uh, give you something that you can kind of read like, you know, just human readable. Same thing with .num. The reason it's called act.num is, uh, is because um, you want to say number of muons greater than 12, yeah, or <laughs> greater than 2 or something. Um, uh, the, the point is that when you put these together, it gets kind of readable. 
Uh, here's another example. Take the uh, the PDG IDs for anti-neutrons um, and select, make a selector uh, and a different reducer from any, it, sorry, a different reducer from maximum, which maximum takes all of your uh, vertices in each event and gives you the one maximum vertex per event. Any says, turns all of these trues and falses to, do you have any true in the event? Does this event have any anti-neutrons? And that's kind of an ex an, uh, a readable way to express this. Do you have any particles whose PDG ID is equal to neutron? So then you can read this one as select events in which any particles are anti-neutrons. Um, and having a way to do that, like to select, uh, select protons in this case, we can make, we can put the data into a form that I'm more familiar with instead of having one big collection of all the particles and being able to tell what kind of particle it is by its PDG ID. Uh, let's make separate collections, a collection of pions, a selection of kaons, a selection of, uh, of protons. And we can attach them to the events. So we can say events.pions, and there they all are, events.kaons, events.protons. And these are all uh, jagged arrays with different numbers. So 51 particles in the first event, 23 of them are pions, six of them are kaons, one of them is a proton. Um, yeah, this is kind of a feedback problem, um, maybe uh, answer me later. Uh, um, this is something we've been kind of on the fence about. Some people would like to say events.pions equals this because you can get them by saying events.pions. Uh, but uh, that could have some bad consequences like uh, uh, Python not knowing which which attribute to assign. Um, so, uh, so if you want to have a long technical discussion about that, uh, about uh, uh, raise that as an issue, uh, uh, so talk to me on GitHub, GitHub issues. But for the moment, the way to assign things uh, is using the square brackets in the string. OK, so now you can do cuts. Uh, and so you can do basic analysis. Um, uh, later on, I'll be talking about combinatorics, where you can do some more real analyses. Um, but before that, uh, we're probably going to want to plot things, so I should talk about flattening. So we've given this a, a whole bunch of structures. Now, you know, we really are talking, at least on a logical view, talking about objects. And records. But uh, a lot of times, you know, the, the reason that you do this is to uh, take all the structure that uh, that a general file format has and reduce that structure into uh, just numbers for machine learning or just numbers for a plot. Uh, and those plotting tools and the machine learning tools and, and some statistical tools uh, they know about NumPy arrays and rectilinear data, but they don't know about awkward arrays. Uh, by design choice, awkward array does not implicitly flatten when it's given to one of these things. You have to flatten it yourself. And the reason is that you might make different choices about how to flatten it, because this is a lossy transformation. Um, you, you lose information by flattening. Uh, I want it to be in your hands. So uh, the basic tool, for removing structure is called flatten. <clears throat> uh, its default is axis is one, but I'm just being explicit there. So uh, flatten with axis equals one says, take these particles grouped by events and just make one big array of particles. Uh, you are flattening axis one. So the, 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 the axis one, which means the, the, the second dimension, goes away. 
it all just becomes one dimension. And now you can see, instead of having 10,000 events, we've got some uh, 350,000 particles. Uh, and But there's still structures. You can see that it still has an ID, a PDG. Uh, these are still particle objects with all of their internal structure. You, we can go crazy and say axis is none, just flatten everything. And now it's just uh, 14 million floating point numbers without differentiating whether these are IDs or particle IDs or, or momenta or vertex positions. So probably not something you want to do. Uh, at least, uh, at least not to particles. Um, so for plotting, you probably want to pick one field and flatten it because you're interested in plotting just the the, the momentum or just the vertex position. So flattening with x is equals one, and then picking out that attribute is what you probably want to do. Um, right, and then we. Uh, this is just sort of an editorial here. Making the flattening explicit is a reminder that a histogram whose entries are particles is different from a histogram whose entries are events. The point of this is to try to make uh, the analysis code more readable. So here we're just using directly matplotlib, uh, and it makes something that looks like a matplotlib plot, but I'm going to do exactly the same thing with boost histogram and MPL hap um, and get something that looks a bit more particle physics y. Um, and what we've asked for is uh, in the events, take the kaons, take their momentum, and flatten them, uh, and axis equals one by default. So here we're looking at kaon momentum. If the particles are sorted, then you might be <clears throat> then you might be interested in the first one or the second one. Uh, sort and arg sort are in, are in development. Um, so we might want to use the event structure rather than just flatten it away. Uh, so this is an analysis choice. You want to you have to decide that you want to do this. So from the events, the kaons, the momentum. In the first dimension, uh, pick we want uh, at least one kaon, and then we want that one kaon. This is a different kind of flattening. You know, we haven't, you know, we're using the event structure because uh, the zeroth is meaningful. Uh, or perhaps the maximum. And momentum <clears throat> in each event. Uh, uh, and that's what I'm going to do down here. Uh, this one has to be flattened with, <clears throat> oh, let's find that in a moment. Axis is zero to remove the non values. So we have um, maximum k on. Uh, some of these events don't have k ons, so the maximum is none. Uh, so here we'll be doing a flattening. Flattening at axis equals zero means we're not removing a list structure, we're just removing the nuns. So 4.98, 4.04, so just the nuns have gone away. Uh, and that's a natural consequence of flattening. Flattening always gets rid of nuns, um, uh, but flat, flattening at axis zero doesn't do anything other than removing the nuns. So we put that all together and here we are showing the, mom the momentum of the kaon that has the most momentum in each event. So kaon's momentum, pick its maximum, uh, ignore the nuns, and there you have a plot. Uh, I like the fact that this flattening has to be explicit. It's a reminder that the empty contents are not counted in the histogram. So if you're ever looking at two histograms and they have, one of them has a different number of entries, uh, uh, this is in the analysis code, putting it, making it explicit that, uh, that we, we, we dropped entries because they didn't have a maximum can momentum. 
Uh, oh yeah, and then um, I did this example where we wanted to plot the momentum of the kaon with the farthest vertex. So we want to maximize on one quantity and plot a different quantity. And uh, that is a consequence of putting a bunch of these things together. And then I looked at it after, you know, I took a step back and I looked at it. And I said, gee, this looks awfully complicated. Um, you use argmax, in order to find the position of, uh, you know, the index position of the one that has the maximum. And then for some, some technical reasons, you want to wrap them into, uh, you want to turn the index two and none into bracket two and nothing. And I looked at that and I thought, that is kind of complicated for, you just gonna be doing this in data analysis all the time. This sort of thing ought to be wrapped up in a function. And so um, this functionality, which you can do manually by putting these things together, I think there's going to be a high level function for doing that, like max by. Uh, so you can maximize one thing by another thing. Um, so let me skip this for now, unless there's a specific question, like somebody really wants to see this. I'm looking at the chat. And I think I'm going to skip this and move on. Although, hey, you get a plot <laughs> when you put it all together. So putting it all together, ah, I think maybe that should be a shorter line. Um, all right, next topic. Here I was just talking about flattening things in order to, uh, in order to plot them. Um, uh, also in this section, I'm talking about uh, uh, turning things into NumPy arrays. Uh, and so they're not necessarily going to be flat, but they are going to be rectilinear. Um, and as you know, there's a different number of kaons in each event. Uh, let me actually use that act events kaons ID. So this variable, this last one has just one of them and this first one has a whole bunch. Um, this uh, act pad none, three, will pad them so that uh, each has at least three. And I guess the reason I'm looking at only 30 and then uh, uh, making a list is so that you can see this more easily. Uh, the first event had six kaons. That's more than three, so they just go through. The second one didn't have any at all, so you get none, none, none. And this last event actually had two, and so it's padded by one. So padding is a nice uh, uh, function for making sure that you have at least a uh, particular number, but that's still not rectilinear because some of these have six and some of them have three. So we can say flip equals true. And then the things that had six now have exactly three, the, the things that have three have exactly three. Uh, and this structure is now rectilinear. It's something that we could pass to something that wants a NumPy array. And this, this is the kind of thing that we we've done in the past, you know, you would do a loop over kaons, and then um, uh, if they, and, and we have some array that we're filling, and if we are beyond the end of the array, well, uh, break that inner loop and continue the outer loop in order to um, uh, drop everything that uh, that we can't represent in an array of this shape. And pad everything that doesn't have enough. Now those none values are also not useful if you're going to a, a NumPy array. So then there's fill none. Um, and I want to sort of emphasize that the combinatorial, yeah, sorry, no, that's the wrong word. The combinational nature of this library is a bunch of little functions that each do one thing. And it might not be obvious at, at first how to solve a particular problem, but 
uh, it can be solved by, by putting these things together like Lego bricks. The first uh, padded everything with nuns, and the second is replacing those nuns with a value like minus one. So put that all together, and this is the kind of array that you'd want to pass to you know, some machine learning framework, because it would have your and your, your three most important whatevers. And if you don't have three important whatevers, you, uh, you know, you, you put in a, a, a padding value. Uh, and then these can be vectors for a machine learning thing. Uh, and then they are awkward brand arrays. We want to have NumPy brand arrays, so just cast it or use the tNumPy function. If you just tried to cast the original by design choice, this raises an error. Um, this has a variable number of kaons in each event, and we don't want to uh, we don't want to make irregular arrays. Um, we want to prevent uh, libraries that just cast whatever you have as a NumPy array. From, from working if the data is going to be wrong. So that's about uh, uh, how to remove the structure from your arrays. Any last uh, questions about that before I go on to the broadcasting and then combinatorics? If not, okay. Uh, broadcasting an awkward array, just like it is in NumPy, is a thing that sounds complicated if you talk about it, but uh, isn't complicated if you just implicitly use it. Um, so I'll, I'll lead with an example. Uh, here we've got a NumPy array, and we want to add 100 to it. Well, 100 has a different shape from an array of length 5. So what NumPy does is it, you know, copy pastes the 100 into an array of 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, and then adds them element by, by element. And that's, you know, that's just what you wanted to have done anyway. Um, usually you don't even want to, you know, talk about it. Um, in awkward array, this means that we could have uh, nested lists of variable sizes, like three, none, two, and we might want to add this to a flat array. We have one thing per entry, and so think of this as a particle array, and this is an event array. And what you want to have happen is you want to have the event uh, data be like duplicated for each particle. Uh, the example that I give um, in LHC circles is, okay, uh, these uh, magenta boxes, this is the MET missing energy. And in the yellow boxes, um, uh, these are the JET, uh, JET PT. And let's say they want to do MET plus JET, or more likely MET minus JET. Uh, you just say that, MET minus JET, and it will subtract the right things. So here we have an awkward array with uh, variable length lists, and we have a NumPy array, which is fixed size. We just add them, we don't have any special syntax. And the 100 goes to all three of these. The 200 goes to nothing. The 300 goes to all two of these. Uh, and, you know, this emulates uh, this for loop code, you know, um, there is some event level variable like event true x and some kon level variable like kon vertex x and you probably want to subtract the two and you want to use the same event x for all of the kons in that event but you know this this syntax down here yeah that just does it so uh, this is that now why do i have a zip uh, the, the zip is just to uh to make pairs of x and y uh to avoid uh, complicating this let me just 
take out the heart of this and just do that. So you don't have to do anything special. Some of the, the questions I've received is, how do I do this? And the answer is, well, just subtract them. Uh, sometimes you want to be explicit about broadcasting, and so there is a, a, a function that will give you explicit broadcasting. That is to be preferred over um, multiplying by zero, <laughs> which is a way to do it, you know. Anyway. Uh, because, you know, adding and multiplying will, will it will trigger the broadcasting, and that's how some people in their analyses uh, uh, get it, get things to broadcast, but there's, there's a function for that. All right, so now, uh, um, unless there are questions, uh, going on to the realistic analysis case, where uh, we don't want to just, you know, cut particles and, and plot them. Uh, we want to find pairs of particles from different collections and, uh, and compute things for those pairs. Um, uh, the reason that we have these uh, nested structures in the first place. Um, so the uh, uh, combinatorics are needed at all levels of physics analysis. And actually, it's, it's interesting the degree to which we use this in particle physics, but it's not used very much outside of particle physics. And that's why there aren't tools, and that's why I had to write awkward arrays, because there weren't tools for doing this already. Um, this sort of thing, it seems like it ought to be really useful, and maybe um, we as particle physicists will, will teach the world a thing or two about uh, uh, doing analysis with structures. Uh, but we use it at every level, like Genrico matching, um, you have a collection of gen particles, a collection of Rico particles, and you want to find the best ones for each. Cleaning, oops, cleaning like associating soft photons with electrons or leptons to a jet. Um, same structure as gen particle, uh, gen Rico matching. Uh, I'll get to the question in a moment. Bump hunting, which will be the examples I give, I'll, I'll be showing you. Uh, and Dalit's analysis, you know, finding combinations of three instead of combinations of two. So question, uh, tying this back to uproot, all the operations we're doing now, uh, uh, are they being run on one copies of the data or two copies of the uh, copies of the data in Ocarays, copies of the data in uproot cache, or three, uh, would they generate a read from the file? Okay. Uh, in the examples that I did, I will I'll come back to combinatorics. Uh, this, I'll emphasize was a small file. So I read the whole thing into memory. And this is where I did it. Um, for the tea trees, oh, I didn't even, I didn't even go and be explicit about that, although I could be explicit about that. Uh, I read out all the branches, made their names real strings, uh, and for each one of them, uh, converted it to uh, an awkward one style array. So none of these things are rereading from the file because we have enough memory for that. Uh, but also, um, the current version of uproots will read awkward zero arrays. And so if we wanted to be doing all of this analysis stuff that I'm talking about in the second half of the notebook, we'd have to be converting them to awkward one, awkward one every time we read it, and that would seriously complicate the examples. If uh, we were doing this, this tutorial a month, or maybe, maybe more realistically a month and a half from now, uh, uh, Upward 4 would be available, and Upward 4 would just read things natively into Upward 1 arrays. Uh, and then we could use that cache thing, and we could, we could be doing that. Uh, um, without complicating the examples. But for these studies, everything is, uh, uh, was read once from the, uh, the file, converted into awkward one style arrays, and then all of this analysis is being done with awkward one arrays. Okay. Get back where I was. Okay, oh, the question is, I'm just trying to determine how to run these selector type analysis uh, for infrequent events dealing with large data files. 
for large data files, memory management, large data files, you would have an iterate, and the first line in that iterate would be uh, the conversion here. The first line in that loop, in that iterate loop. In order, and then in order to uh, clean up the, the analysis script and, and reduce the noise, uh, you might want to wrap that into a function. And especially if you end up doing this to your events, yeah, uh, that should be wrapped up in a function. And in fact, uh, really this kind of thing, as well as adding behaviors, that should be in a framework library that runs on top of um, uh, Awkward Array. I would recommend uh, having some library for dealing with uh, EIC uh, formatted files that runs on top of Awkward Array, creates this structure for you, uh, and defines all of the behaviors uh, so that when you uh, write in your analysis, in your analysis, when you write an upper iterate loop, it can be just one function call on that at the very beginning. Okay, yeah, in progress of putting this, fantastic. Great. Yeah. This is something that we noticed with the LHC analyses. Uh, there's uh, a group within CMS uh, called Coffee, or it looks like it's spelled Coffea, but it's Italian for coffee. Um, that group uh, has made a whole bunch of intermediate tools that live on top of uh, Awkward Array and below the actual uh, data analysis uh, scripts. Um, and that's been enormously helpful because we don't want the Awkward Array to have a lot of experiment specific stuff in it. And we don't want the uh, analysis scripts to have to do all of this structuring every time. So it, it's a good model to have. In this, uh, in this kind of diagram where you have NumPy, Awkward Array, Uproot, you have another box on top of that and below the analysis scripts for the EIC stuff. Okay, so unless other questions, I'll get back to regularly scheduled combinatorics. Okay, all right. So, uh, so yeah, combinatorics are um, uh, essential to uh, a particle physics analysis, or a realistic one at least. Um, and the way, and usually this, it, uh, it, this seems to necessitate for loops because the because we're doing complicated things with these um, uh, uh, with the combinatorics. Uh, in order to express these things in array at a time operations, it follows generally this this kind of pattern. We do one thing, which explodes out the structure, and that will involve uh, Cartesian product or combinations. Uh, and then we do a bunch of the, the analysis code on flat operations. And then we'll have some kind of reducers to implode it back down to one per event or one per particle. So this is taking advantage of the fact that you can ex actually explode out to as many levels deep of nested lists as you need. Um, uh, but, you know, a physics view is really just one level deep as events and as particles. And maybe you have events, particles, and hits or something. So the two work workhorse functions for, for doing the common torques is Cartesian and combinations. And we've been able to go pretty far with this in the, uh, the, the coffee analyses. Uh, Cartesian computes a Cartesian product, sometimes known as a cross product if you're from SQL world. Um, and the important thing is, unlike SQL, this is per nested list. So you've got all of these variable sized uh, lists and you've got the same number of them because um, you've got particles, 
in the first event, particles in the second event, particles in the third event, you got another array with the same number of events, but different numbers of particles. And so event by event, they line up. And in each group of particles, we do the Cartesian product of that group. So here, three times two is six. Here, zero times one is zero. One times two is one. Uh, and that will give you all of the, uh, like you do this on, uh, uh, I'm gonna do it with, I think, hands and protons to get lambdas, if I remember right? No, it's not. Maybe it is. <laughs> Forgetting physics, how about this? Um, we do this on two collections of particles, uh, and then we get particle A, particle B pairs. Combinations also gives you particle A, particle B pairs, but uh, uh, it does like the N choose K type thing. Um, you, it gives you, you take one selection and in SQL speak, you self join it with itself uh, to get the four choose two is six, zero to choose, choose two is zero, two choose two is two per nested list. And that's because the default axis for each of these is axis equals one. That's the default. Um, you can also do other axes. So, uh, so let's take some simple examples. Do the Cartesian product of one, two, three with A, B, nothing with C, four with, with D, E, E. Well, we get pairs of one A, one B, two A, two B, three A, three B. Nothing and then 4D, 40. Common combinations takes one array and a number. So these are the uh, four choose two. And I could do four choose three. And then this, this nothing in that last one because you can't make three out of this. Um, but you can make three out of, the, out of these guys. <clears throat> So um, let's use it for physics. Uh, here's a physics I forgot. Lambdas go to uh, I proton. So we make Cartesian product of pairs of ions and protons. And this is why I'm, I'm usually accustomed to uh, uh, having collections of particles. Um, if you had just one big group of particles, then what we would be doing is a combinations choose two and we'd be throwing out a whole lot of combinations where uh, uh, it's not the part of, it's not the PDG IDs that we want. Um, and as you can guess, making making exploding stuff out into a bunch of combinations is both uh, memory and CPU you want to issue, you want to think about it. <clears throat> so um, uh, Actually, at first blush, a lot of people, when they first see this, they think it's always going to be a problem. Um, but actually, if you just try it, it's, it's only sometimes a problem. Only if you uh, uh, are using very large collections. In this data set, it's, it's not a problem. So here's a, a mass function that takes pairs, uh, a left mass and a right mass, um, uh, because they weren't in the pairs. Unzip is the opposite of zip, and it'll get you the, see up here you have pairs of, you have these left-right pairs. Oh, let me actually do this. So we've done this. Now if I do unzip, you get all the lefts, and all the rights. That's what that is. And zipping and unzipping and uh, um, um, projecting is, they're, they're essentially free. So you, you can, the structures are fluid. You can do this anytime you want. So we get left and right. <clears throat> and then we do uh, a mass calculation. So we uh, get the masses. And here I can apply it to the pairs where I, uh, intentionally put in the left mass and the right mass. And then I realized after doing this, I could have used the particle library to, to get like PDG values for these masses, and that would have been a good idea. 
to showcase that, but I didn't think of it. <clears throat> so, um, so now these are masses, uh, masses of pairs. So here, this jagged array is not a jagged array of particles, it's a jagged array of pairs of particles. These lengths are different than the lengths of number of particles. Um, <clears throat> but we can just uh, histogram them anyway. Uh, we're doing the same thing that we would have done with, with particles, so I compute the masses again, uh, and I flatten it so we can put it into a plot. <clears throat> and indeed, yes, there is a, a, a longer peak. Uh, to make this uh, a more realistic analysis, uh, we'll probably want to pick opposite sign pairs, or maybe pick uh, uh, pairs where there's a distance cut, okay, because these are lambdas. Uh, we want displaced vertices. So uh, these are things that we can do just by applying them to the pair objects. <coughs> and we get a better lambda peak. And I realize now I'm losing my voice, but just in time, because we're near the end of the material. Um, and then here's another one of these asides where uh, a, um, a framework might want to put methods on pairs. Um, you know, maybe uh, mass should be something that you do with all particle pairs. And maybe these should be methods. Um, so that when you take a Cartesian product of things, you can give the Cartesian product records a name. And then because it has a name, it can recognize, oh, I have an, uh, uh, a jagged array of these. I will use this behavior on those pairs. And then, um, you know, I guess we're, you know, rearranging the deck chairs, but uh, um, we have a nicer syntax for doing domain specific things. In general, I, I, I like to make a separation between the awkward array structure level things are uh, free, uh, free functions like awk dot flatten right here is a structure thing that you're doing. Uh, that goes to the left, and then all of the domain-specific things like finding opposite pairs, finding, uh, putting on a distance cut, um, computing masses, those are domain-specific things, putting them to the right, and then you have a nice separation between uh, uh, things that are fundamental and structural and things that are domain-specific and defined by the, the framework. It also helps uh, users know um, what is the distinction between the two levels. <clears throat> so, self-study question. I, I, I guess I'll just ask you this to put it out in the void, and we, and, uh, and then I'll just move on. Uh, is why does the call to mass have to be last? And if you think about it, and if you can answer why we can say dot, why we can say dot mass last, but I couldn't um, uh, put it before last. Uh, if you can answer that question for yourself, then, then um, you've understood this quite a bit. Um, and I'll move on to an example for combinations. Uh, use combinations if you are selecting from the same um, uh, from the same collection, and you want to pick just a number of unique combinations from that. Um, yep, um, that's the function for it. Uh, I like to think of this as, um, I like to think of combinations as mentally making a rectangle where you have all of the pions on this axis, all of the protons on that axis, and you want every combination in that rectangle. And the combinations function makes an upper triangle. It, it does pions with pions, so it's square, and it does the upper triangle of that matrix. There's a uh, uh, replacement, I believe. Yeah, yeah, there's a replacement if you want to include the diagonal. Usually we don't. 
Um, and then uh, since I've made these pairs uh, with the, and I've named the record, uh, then the record has inherited all these methods and I can do the same thing to it. I can compute opposite sign uh, pions because that didn't happen here. Uh, ask for a, a displacement and then and do all that before computing the mass. Uh, and now these are uh, k short to pi pi because it's also a displaced vertex. Uh, I started working on this uh, bonus problem with uh, d zeros. Uh, and the reason that I did that was because um, this is quite a bit more complicated. Uh, <coughs> this uh, data file was not given pi zeros. It was given uh, gammas. And so the first step was to construct the pi zeros from the gammas using uh, um, combinations because you're pulling from one set. And then it does Cartesian uh, triples um, to make the, the charge k on charge pi on neutral pi on triples. Um, and I'm not going to go through all that because uh, this step here of making the pi zeros uh, strains the limit of uh, uh, the memory that we have. <coughs> Sometimes it fails in uh, binder. Is it not enough memory? <coughs> um, uh, yeah, so that's something you would need to do with smaller chunks, or you could be smarter about putting uh, cuts on it. Before, like, uh, it, like um, I think if you require the vertex to be uh, uh, something small, you won't get conversions or something. But you know, these are all analysis things to think about. Uh, and I'm not going to go through it because uh, the Dallas plot didn't look right, so I think I'm doing something wrong. So I'm going to move on. <laughs> um, there, I think that I got through everything that was, no, there was one more interesting thing, and that was number. So uh, since, you know, uh, at this point, I'm going to skip over reducing from combinations. Because that's that whole explode out, do something, and then reduce in. The combinatorics examples I gave you exploded out to a bunch of mass candidates, and then I just flattened the mass candidates. I didn't do an implosion back in. But in some problems, you will want to do an implosion back in. So that's uh, what that section describes. But since uh, you were specifically interested in number, I'm going to skip to that. Um, because we are getting rather late. And also, I'm going to lose my voice, so I won't be able to keep going. Uh, so I'll get the important things in first. All right, now, everything I've shown you here, uh, it sounds like I am advertising for the array at a time way of, of doing analysis. Uh, and I'm half advertising for that, because um, uh, that allows you, the array at a time mode allows you to, compi to, to combine fast compiled code because each one of those um, kernels that do things like count number, count, make combinations and uh, Cartesian products and all that, those are all compiled code. Um, so, uh, and they were uh, developed in such a way that they can operate on dynamically typed objects. So you get to do data analysis with dynamically typed objects uh, you know, types are all determined at runtime, but they run in fast compiled code because you're doing things at a rate of time. You know, you had that jet structure that, sorry, jet structure. You had that event structure that was um, maybe, you know, um, 20 or 30 objects deep, you know, uh, 20 or 30 fields if you add up everything. Uh, all of the dynamic type checking has to be done on 30 items, not on not on the 10,000 items, or in a more realistic case, billions of items in uh, data analysis. So changing your mental model to be able to work with uh, array at a time functions gives you that benefit. However, there's another way to do it, and this is equally good. You can still write imperative code uh, and have it run at compile time speeds in Python uh, if 
the code is dynamically compiled, if it's just-in-time compiling. Numba is a just-in-time compiler for Python. So here's an example of, of Numba. Um, uh, you define a function as you might in ordinary Python. Uh, this one's calculating pi by, you know, Monte Carlo. Um, and if you call just the, the pure Python function, which I did by extracting this thing from, from its decorator, if you call just the, the plain Python function, it takes 962 milliseconds, but if you run the just-in-time compiled function, it was 10 milliseconds. And, uh, and actually part of that includes the compilation itself, the first time it's run at least. Subsequent times is not, so I'm, yeah, it was lost in the noise. Okay. Um, you know, so look, you know, uh, just by putting a decorator on this thing, it's, um, <clears throat> what is that, uh, 100 times faster. Um, so that's great, you know. Uh, we got to write for loops. We don't have to deal with this hard, you know, hard to think about um, array at a time thing. Um, so, uh, we want this to work with awkward arrays also. The, uh, there's a price for this magical speed up. You know, it, it looks great on these, uh, um, in these prepared examples where uh, this prepared example, which comes from Numba's homepage, um, has only, you know, NumPy, Numba compliant things in it. Uh, they can only speed up a subset of Python types in the Python language. Um, and that's a growing subset, but just like uproot, it can't, you know, uproot can't read every root file. Numba can't accelerate every Python function. So you have to be conservative with the functions and language features that you use. They have a, a, a page listing all the things you're allowed to use. Uh, and Numba has to recognize the data types. So we had to make uh, Numba recognize awkward arrays. Uh, here's an example where we do uh, lambda mass calculation, uh, compute lambda, you know, lambda the particle, uh, masses in a conventional way. We get event objects in. We do a loop of those events in order to count the number of pions times the number of protons in order to know how many lambdas there are going to be so we can allocate an array. Then we loop over them again, and now we get to do um, <clears throat> just plain old nested for loops. You can put like break and continue statements in here. This is plain for loops. Uh, so do a double loop over the pions and protons to do the, the common torques the old fashioned way. Uh, and compute masses. I guess I didn't do them in this example, but mass can be an external function if that external function is also decorated. Uh, and after computing each mass, put it in the array that this returns, and there we've got lambda masses. You can see that it is computing lambdas. I didn't put the uh, opposite sign and uh, displaced vertex cuts in there, but you know, if you're familiar with uh, traditional physics analysis, you can definitely do that. You, know, you can put breaking continues. All right, so that's great. We can, uh, if we have a bunch of old analysis code that we want to port over into Python, uh, we don't have to rethink everything in order to turn them into array to time functions, uh, um, we can just translate them into Python, into the subset of Python that number recognizes. So as with all things in number, there are some constraints. Uh, uh, if any, 
if you re hit any of these constraints, you get a, a big long error message where they try to spell it out to you exactly. Oh, I don't recognize this type, blah, blah, blah. Um, so some constraints, uh, awkward arrays are read-only structures. Uh, and actually that's, that's true outside of number. The, these arrays are read-only structures. Um, but they can't be created inside of a number compiled function. So the way, the way that we use it is we already had the events and we pass it in. And we can pass out uh, like a part of those events if we wanted to. Or we could pass out our favorite event, you know, have a function that zips along until it, in fact, that's a great use case. Uh, uh, find some event with a weird pathology and just output that one event. And so you use number to, to write the search function and it outputs that one event and then you can work on that one event. Um, so that was fine because in the previous example, we were outputting a NumPy array and Numba knows how to create num NumPy arrays. In fact, the subset that Numba covers, covers an awful lot of NumPy. So Numba and NumPy go together pretty well. But what if we wanted to create a structure? I mean, the whole idea of awkward arrays is we're gonna have nested structures. And okay, we can pass in a nested structure, but what if we want to get out a, nest, a nested structure? So there is an array builder. Uh, this is a new class. Um, and what it does is create an array builder. The structure that it makes depends on the order in which you call these methods. So if you begin list, begin record, set some fields and put some thing on each field uh, and you do all of that, at the end of all of that, you can get a snapshot of the array and it's an array that has structure. Uh, and maybe this duck string is worth looking into uh, because as an example of how the array builder changes what its assessment is of, of, the, of the data type as these methods are called. So the first time you put in a none value, it's like, oh, well, that's gotta be nullable, um, you know. Uh, Right, so we have this, this is really a general purpose way of making structure. And it's also not the fastest way to make structure. And that was some feedback somebody gave me. I recommended using this thing and they found that uh, it was some 10 times slower than specialized code. It's still like, you know, um, uh, 10 times faster than Python code. So it's kind of in the middle. It has to be, you know, it, it's a dynamically typed thing. But as a general purpose way to, inside of Numba, uh, build some output that has nested structures. So here's something that's going to make, what is this doing? It's making electron photon pairs, I believe. Uh, oh, this was doing that really complicated reduce example, uh, but now doing it in, uh, um, uh, in, in imperative code which is, uh, I think, actually easier to read uh, the imperative example for this. Um, so doing, uh, finding photons that are close to electrons and finding and picking the one that has the smallest angle. So you have a loop over electrons and a loop over photons and you find the one with the best angle. <clears throat> if there wasn't anything at all, you put a null there. If there was something, you put the whole photon in there. And this, uh, you make the array builder, you pass in the events in the builder, and then it has filled all the stuff into the builder. So you get out um, uh, photons or none. Uh, that are closest to each electron. There's a question here. Adding to Vatsu's question, how number processing arrays work together with large files that are read in chunks. I think that I answered this before about um, processing arrays together in large files. It, 
if you're reading this in chunks, then you're doing combinatorics in chunks. Um, because remember that the combinatorics actually apply event per event. And so doing the combinatorics functions on um, 100 events, you just dial down the size of your chunk uh, if you're having memory problems. And, and here, this, uh, and that's, that's doing it with the array of the time functions. Same deal if you're doing it with the uh, number compiled functions. You pass in some chunk of events and you build some output. And you can make a separate builder for each chunk, or you could just accumulate builders, depending on if you can keep that in memory. In this case, because we're making uh, photons that are associated with an electron, the photon that is closest to each electron, or null if there wasn't one. Uh, and let's see, there are 87 events out of the 10,000 that don't have one. Um, uh, you want this to have the same structure as the events because what we're actually going to do is we're going to attach it to the event to the electrons. So now, because we made this having the same length array, we can just attach it directly. And now I'm going to look at some one electron. An electron has all of these fields, and one of the fields is photon. We just attached it. So this is mixing number imperative code and awkward array at a time code. So we, we use the a number function to do the hard hard to hard to think about in array terms part. Uh, to get an array that we attached to our electrons so that we can do these really facile um, uh, plotting expressions. And that is a big electron. All the electrons in event All right, so, uh, so these are the same data structures. They can be mix and matched. Uh, and the idea is since number is rather limited in the kind of uh, language features and types it's able to deal with, uh, the idea is that you, you do the analysis basically in an awkward array, and then you dip into number for anything that's too complicated uh, in, uh, in array at a time terms. So with that, um, I had kind of planned to take the last topics uh, if interested only. So in all of this, I talked about everything actually, except for reducing from combinations using array at a time uh, functions. And I haven't talked about Candice or NumPy Autograd, uh, and that's, that's just uh, talking about uh, third-party libraries. Uh, miscellaneous stuff at the end. So I am either ready to conclude if everybody's tired uh, or ready to take questions. We could call this a, a question segment. Or if you are really interested in something like, uh, oh, I want to use Pandas all the time. How do I do that? Then speak up. And I'll wait until somebody requests something or has a question or uh, and you might need to reach microphone. Yeah. So I hear you. Many, many have already left and um, we are also approaching um, noon at, at the East Coast. So my proposal would be to leave place for perhaps a few more questions, uh, but that's just my my opinion. Okay. Uh, my opinion is yes. a little bit different uh, because I, I'm certainly sorry that you are losing your voice, but at the same time, uh, the recording of these tutorials is uh, just great material, which uh, personally I, for example, miss 
uh, reading, just reading the, uh, uh, the documentation of Upwards and Numba, and maybe uh, if we just uh, finish, I mean, people are free to go certainly, but if we just finish, it will be on recording, and we could actually then have it on YouTube and uh, having this uh, fully kind of explained uh, uh, Jupyter uh, notebook and uh, in uh, in a binder, so uh, it's up to Jim certainly. Sure, um, I think I'll talk about pandas because actually um, I I did a survey through all of the uh, GitHub issues and Stack Overflow questions from the past year about uh, uproot and awkward array, try to figure out what people are interested in, and actually pandas is a hot topic, uh, much more so than I would have than I would have guessed. Um, probably because uh, there's a lot of third-party libraries that use Pandas as a universal interface. So I'll talk about Pandas, uh, but first I'm going to answer this question. Uh, what do you suggest as a complement to tbrowser in root for uproot? Uh, exploration, double-click histograms, right. Uh, there's no GUI. Um, if there, uh, we're trying to take a um, an approach, it, by we, I mean, um, uh, scikit-hep.org. This is sort of a, an umbrella organization. Um, we're trying to take the, the point of view that uh, functionality should be all in small libraries that know how to talk, talk to each other um, and share data structures where, where it makes sense to do so. But each will do one particular thing. So, um, uh, nobody has stepped up to make a GUI, but if there were to be a GUI, uh, it should be a separate project. Um, exploration, uh, actually, maybe I'm old school, but uh, I like exploring with um, uh, uh, little expressions like that. Jupyter has made it a lot easier to do that kind of exploration. The, the uh, small expression-driven exploration. Um, <clears throat> I've been, I guess I'll admit, I've been doing it for years with a hacked Emacs mode, uh, but now we get to use Jupyter. <laughs> um, and it's a really great way to, uh, to do analysis because uh, it's exploratory, it's question and answer based, uh, but also uh, you're not limited to what's available in a GUI. Uh, you can, um, uh, write expressions. Um, in fact, this this whole thing is kind of a GUI, you know. Um, some of the some of the outputs are are HTML, as you'll see in the pandas part that I'll be getting to in just a moment. But here I was just going to get back to advertise. Uh, Scikit-hep is uh, uh, a oh, well, deprecated um, is a, a GitHub organization that collects uh, a bunch of things in various states of development. Uh, but for the most part, uh, we want these to be uh, pretty high quality things. Um, uh, yeah, so something to look at. There's a question. Oh, I created root render Jupyter Lab extension, which allows to inspect root files by clicking on them. Um, at the same time, for a number of issues with JS root, not widely published. Uh, yeah, I don't, yeah, so that's an, so whether that should be, uh, if you're asking about whether that would make sense as a scikit hep project, I'm not sure, because uh, if it's using uh, root directly, I think not very many of these do use direct root directly, like root numpy and root pandas do, uh, but not many of them. I'm not sure which should be parts of uh, uh, contributed to root, but, but that's an open question. It could be interesting. Uh, yeah, you're going to say. Speak up. You you unmuted for a moment. Okay. Um, Roger says I'm currently using pandas describe and similar, but it doesn't always handle the structure. It assumes flat lists. Okay, I'll be talking about that in a moment. Just looking for other ideas. Uh, I agree. It shouldn't go into upgrade itself. Right. In fact, uh, the first step of this separation was making uproot distinct from awkward array, because upward is just I.O. Um, 
Uh, and in fact, that distinction is going to become even more clear because uh, upward four is not going to explicitly depend on upward array. It's going to be an optional dependency rather than a required one. So you'll, if, if anybody has a, a jagged array, they'll get a message saying, please install up, uh, upward array. Um, but that's uh, the loosen dependencies on upward even more. Yeah, okay, I should get back to the, uh, as you get to pandas really. All right, so jagged data in pandas. Um, pandas is popular uh, for good reason. It did a lot of uh, great things, but it does mostly assume uh, rectilinear data. I'll explain them mostly in a moment. Um, but we can get uh, data into pandas because uh, uh, awkward arrays are now, in, in version one at least, recognized as uh, potential columns for a data frame. So you can just put them into a pandas data frame and uh, these three things are awkward arrays. They haven't been transformed into Python objects. Uh, and you can see that because the D type is awkward D type. It's not a, it's not um, uh, D type O. If you're ever working in Pandas and uh, you see that the D type is the letter O, that means it's a NumPy array of Python objects, um, which is not very useful. Uh, now, it's this here. I'm going to make an editorial comment. That this is unlikely to be useful very, for very complex data structures as these are, because there aren't pandas functions for dealing with deeply nested structures. Like, there isn't any pandas dot whatever that I can call that's going to make much sense of one of these things. So uh, the fact that you can do this, you know, more likely what you'll want to do is a um, better example. You probably want to say pandas, ah, bad keystrokes, data frame, X and let's pick uh, events, pions, VTX, X, something like that. Even then, um, it's a bunch of X values. Maybe you could make use of that. Um, maybe you could get this, this thing and then want to, I don't know, plus 100, let's say. Um, all of these vectorized options, uh, vectorized operations like array at a time things like plus apply um, vectorally, and and that that makes use of it. But I think more likely you're going to want to take the structure that you have in an awkward array and explode it out into structures that Candace recognizes. So there's a function for that. Uh, all of the third party functions are awkward dot name of the third party library dot some function. So the function that turns pions into a data frame explodes it out. Uh, it finds all of the fields in the pions and makes each one of those fields a column, which is what you want to do. Uh, the list of pions was uh, a nested list. You know, there were per event, there were up, uh, some number of pions per event. And you can see that here with the rows are broken into entries and sub-entries. This is a pandas feature called multi-index, but the index has two parts to it. And this is why I say that pandas deals with mostly rectilinear data because uh, after having like sparsified is in this in a kind of sparse representation, it's rectangular, but it represents data that's not rectangular. Let me do this with uh, protons, um, because a lot of these have nothing. Uh, 
or just, no, a lot of these, yeah, a lot of these have only one proton. Like the first event has one proton, and, and entry zero has one proton. Entry one doesn't have any protons, so it's gone. Entry two has one proton, and a couple of these have two protons. And then the columns, the reason that they look like this is because they are deeply nested structures. This is, these are also uh, multi-indexes in pandas, and it's dir.z, or for this ridiculous one here, smear.orge.vtx.z. And this is how it renders them on, um, in Jupyter. So now pandas knows what to do with them. Um, what if you have two types of particles, like pions and kaons? Here I'm going to say this is where uh, uh, pandas is starting to lose, lose usefulness, uh, but I'll, I'll show this example and make that clear. Um, and uh, I'm also at the same time going to simplify this so we have fewer columns, because we have way too many columns. So I'm going to start by uh, simplifying the, the array, we have fewer fields, and now, oops, this is a data frame of the simpler one. It at least fits on one screen. Um, so here, right, all of these, uh, all of these columns on the left, they are all pion columns. All of these columns on the right are all KN columns. That's the that's the hierarchical nesting of the columns. And then there's a hierarchical nesting of the rows. But now, subentry zero, the first pion, is the same row as subentry zero, for the kaons. That is probably not what you want. Uh, because it's not necessarily a, a relationship between the first pion in the list and the first kaon of the list. So this is where I'm, I'm saying that uh, uh, pandas is losing its usefulness for these kinds of structures. It's okay if you have only one kind of jaggedness, only pions or only kaons. Um, but if you have both pions and kaons, then you have to do kind of weird things like this. This was a lossy transformation. We've lost the fact that uh, you have n pions and m kaons. And, and uh, we're losing this information in a very uh, specific way. There is a DFS function that gives a list of data frames that, if you have a list of data frames that does preserve all the information, the pions and the kaons, two different data frames that fully preserves the information because these subentries are not those subentries. And then the generic function that's not pluralized, that gives you one data frame, what it's really doing is it's, it's producing all of the data frames and then using a pandas function called merge, which has a parameter called inner, as you call how. You can do inner joins outer joins, et cetera, as ways of merging it. So that lost information is, the information is lost in a user controllable way, actually using pandas. The difference between an inner uh, an inner join and an outer join, it's, it's this is SQL, is if Pion number 12 exists, but kaon number 12 doesn't exist, an inner join will throw it away so that everything has a value. An outer join, if pion number 12 exists, but kaon number 12 doesn't exist, then the kaons is filled with, with missing values. Actually, that happened to number seven and eight here. Um, so yeah, fundamentally, an awkward array can be converted into a set of pandas data frames, and then if you want one pandas data frame, you have to merge it and you have to decide how you want to merge it.
and then we go to the pandas documentation because really it's just calling merge pandas dot merge. I think that's everything I had to say about pandas. Um, and uh, I don't know, do we really want to see the last few sections? Um, um, for the sake of the recording, I'll, I'll record it. Um, for third party libraries, uh, NumExpr is this great thing that computes um, NumPy expressions faster by making one pass rather than multiple passes. Um, so it can compute px squared plus py squared plus pz squared without squaring all the px's, squaring all the py's, squaring all the pz's, and then adding all those intermediate arrays together. So it uses less memory and it does it in one pass so it's faster. But it doesn't recognize awkward arrays. Um, it takes an awkward array and tries to turn it into a numpy array, but that would be wrong. So uh, the awkward array refuses to do so. Uh, and so this uh, numexpr doesn't work applied to awkward arrays. Somebody wanted to use numexpr. So um, we've wrapped it in a way that does deal with awkward arrays. So now this has produced a uh, a jagged array output that retains the structure of the input that computes this expression at every level and does it in one pass. Similarly, autograd, somebody wanted to do um, uh, differentiation, uh, auto differentiation, um, and we wanted to do it at the um, level of every element of a uh, numpy array. So you want to compute all the values of a function and all of its derivatives in, in one pass. Uh, Autograd does that for NumPy arrays. Uh, where are we? Uh, Awkward.autograd does that for NumPy arrays. Um, and we intend to support a large number of third party libraries because the idea of this is that uh, Uproot gets the data into uh, the uh, Python scientific ecosystem and awkward array makes it, you know, deals with the fact that uh, we have these structures, but then this is all just a gateway into all of those um, libraries that are out there. So three that we that we plan to deal with uh, rather soon actually is uh, Apache Arrow, which is good for moving data with nested structure. So it's, you know, Whereas we manipulate data with nested structure, Arrow moves data with nested structure, so it uh, makes a lot of sense to support that. And one of the things that Arrow can move it to is the Parquet file format. So, okay, great, we get another file format. And that's a, a widely used industry standard thing. Czar is an array de delivery system that is used by geneticists, uh, and they also are aware of uh, ragged arrays. They use the ragged instead of jagged. Uh, this is one in particular uh, we want to deal with this this summer, uh, extending all of these array at a time operations to GPUs where GPUs, uh, the best way to use the GPU is to do everything array at a time. Uh, so we want to support CuPy, which is like NumPy for, for GPU arrays, and we want all of these operations to run on the GPU. So then you'll be able to have this awkward array is on the CPU. I just built it with an array builder, let's say. Uh, and then we do one copy of the data from CPU to GPU. And then we do all of our analysis on the GPU uh, and maybe export it to CuPy arrays so that a uh, machine learning framework can pick it up and go uh, or whatever. So that's in the, that's in the plans. and. Uh, uh, both of these third-party libraries here, NumExpr and Autograd, were just responses to user requests. People wanted to do particular things. And um, uh, they both happen to be rather easy. So these, these kinds of things can be done. So make a GitHub issue um, uh, if there's a third-party library that isn't automatically supported uh, and you'd like to see supported. 
now I've talked about third party libraries and I've done things a little out of order. So maybe you want to you want to add to the video time markers for when each of these sections begins. Um, uh, and I've talked about everything except for reducing from combinatorics, which uh, let me just say is the most advanced of the advanced combinatorics. <laughs> and I guess we'll do that last. Uh, so any uh, last questions about third party libraries? Yes, because uh, the last strongest people are leaving. So if you have any questions left, uh, probably it's it's good time. And then yes, the last part. If not, I'll keep going. So uh, reducing from combinations. Yeah, you, you can tell when I when I have too much material as if it takes is it two and a half hours now. Okay. <laughs> Last topic, reducing from combinations. Um, if you remember, we there's this pattern of uh, exploding out to um, uh, to do combinatorics, do a bunch of flat operations on that, and then you implode in. And this imploding is almost always reducers. Uh, the mass peak examples didn't need reducers because you just, you know, make histograms of every mass candidate. But if you wanted to do something like make uh, a histogram, well, this would have been a, a, a better motivated example, make a histogram with one entry per histogram bin where it's the best mass per event or the first by some kind of sorting or um, best fits the quality cuts or something like that, uh, that would uh, follow this ex explode and then reduce kind of pattern. Uh, so the example that I did choose to give is uh, find the nearest photon to each electron. That's also the example that I gave in Numba. So we make collections of electrons and photons. Um, and now uh, the first step toward making the nearest photon to each electron is we have to make photon-electron pairs. Then we do a flat calculation, which is what is the angle between every one of those pairs. And then we do a reduction, which is pick the one with the best angle, the smallest angle. Um, so first we do a Cartesian product. And the problem with the basic Cartesian product is that all the combinations are mixed together in the same lists. And you know what? This example of them being mixed together in a single list and this one not being mixed together in a single list, see there's two levels of brackets here instead of just one. It's way too big to see it. So I'm gonna go up to where we have the original example of the, the really basic combinatorics example, like this guy. So remember this guy? The thing that I'm doing is using uh, nested equals true. And in order to nested equals true, compare and contrast. Here, in the first event, we have six combinations. Here, in the first event, we have three pairs of combinations, three, uh, yeah. And then in this inner grouping, the um, this is an inner grouping of everything with a one. This is the inner grouping of everything with a two, and it's the inner grouping of everything with a three. For our problem of matching electrons to photons, we're going to use nested equals true so that we get a new additional level of nesting uh, in which everything in a list all has the same electron. So that we can, when after we've computed 
uh, angles between electrons and photons, uh, it'll be easy to say, reduce that to get uh, the electron-photon pair that's best per electron. So that's, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use the table of contents to find where it was. Right. So here's the electrons, ele electron photon combinations without nested is true. And with nested is true, the um, uh, these are all the ones with electron ID three. And these are all the ones with positron ID 131. So they've been grouped. Now, um, computing angles uh, for nested nested lists is the same as for nested lists and the same for unnested lists. It's uh, because these um, uh, The multiplication just goes down to the deepest level. So cosine pairs is something that we can apply directly to electron photon combinations. Boom, you know, that's it. Uh, and then we can combine, we can flatten all of these down to the deepest level where we don't want to have to flatten axis one, flatten axis two, just flatten, just all the way down. It's a good reason to use axis equals none. Uh, um, to see all the angles. This is all the angles for all the electron positron pairs. Now we find the best ones by doing an argmax, making singletons, and that gives you a jagged array of integers you can put inside the square brackets. That's that thing that I said, do a maximization by one parameter and apply it to another thing, where I said, well, yeah, you can build it out of primitive tools, but it looks awfully complicated. Maybe it should be wrapped up with a high-level function. Yeah, maybe that should be wrapped up with a high-level function. But you can do it. You can piece things together. You can use the argmax to find the the best cosine angle uh, and select just the ones for which that's true. And now the distribution of the remainder uh, are biased toward having high angles as opposed to the distribution of everything. Now that I think about it, um, there's a lot of anti-pointing. Photons are pointing the opposite way. That's weird. All right. Um, now, by construction, with this uh, singleton function that you can read up on your own, by construction, the, the best electron photons has zero or one elements in each inner nested loop, inner nested list. So we ask for the number at x is equals two. And what's happened is that the 16 pairs, the 16 electron photon pairs for a given electron has been reduced to one electron photon pair for a given electron. And in some cases, zero. But we're going to see any of this. Uh, let me think. There were two electrons in this event. Yeah. Um, We no longer care about that inner structure, so we're going to flatten it, but we're not flattening at axis one, we're flattening at axis two. This is why everything has an axis parameter. Um, uh, and it lets you do that, and since we've flattened at axis equals two, we've, we've turned the one of those into just a value. And we've turned uh, zero of those into a skip, so it no longer has the same length. And here I'm getting into complexity again. There's an opposite of singletons called firsts. 
uh, that gives you zero or one object and then it has the same length. Everything has the same length. So now we can pair it up and attach to the electrons a photon or attach a none. The first turns empty lists into none, empty lists into nuns. Um, yes, and that's one of those things where you do it out and then uh, you look, sit back and look at it and say, that's awfully complicated for something that would be a regular analysis task. So this is the sort of thing that as awkward array evolves, there will be more high level functions for just do that kind of thing out of the box. Although you can get down to the to uh, uh, operating on primitive structures directly. And there's always the number way out. You can always write imperative code to do this sort of thing as I've, as I've shown. All right, so um, Roger has a comment that I want to read from the comments. Great job, very relevant. Thanks for supporting the community. You're welcome. Uh, binder kernel on just got killed. Uh, on Jesus got killed several times during the tutorial. Uh, there were a couple of examples uh, where we do use a lot of memory um, because I have loaded everything. And uh, uh, going from a laptop where you have a lot of memory to um, binder where it's quite limited or Jesus, I don't know about that about that um, uh, computer. Um, yeah, memory uh, is a thing that needs to be thought about when you're going through analysis. You, you work out the analysis procedure on a small set and then you, uh, in order to scale up, you'll need to do it in batches at some level. It's just a question of how large those batches are. And then there's 10 second delay between audio and screen share, which can get using when pointing at things. Oh, oops. Okay. I guess I uh, uh, needed to do some pointing more slowly. Um, yes. But on that note, I've covered everything. And uh, go ahead. You were going to speak? Someone unmuted? Yeah, so I just